There, there were young people that would be just playing in the glory. <laughs> Explain that. Well, that was uh, Ralph Riggs and uh, C.W. Ward. Now, not C.M. Ward, C.W. Okay. That, when, when that glory would get so thick, Ralph told me you, sometimes you couldn't see more than 10 foot from you. He said him and Ralph would, would play hide and go seek until their parents, their mothers found out, caught them, and then put a stop to it. Tell me about Goldie, who had a specialty for growths. Goldie, Goldie, that's the one that, 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 that led me to the Lord at Venice and brought me to Pisgah. She even would take a little dustpan and put it in a towel and throw it away. People with growths going out all over them. She, she just loved praying for them. She said she'd stand there and watch them, and they're just falling off. And some of them, you could hear the little clicks as they hit the ground. And she would get them and sweep them. She didn't want them laying around there, you know, rotting and getting bad. She'd clean them up and put them in a towel, go them, throw them in the trash. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Long for Truth. My name is Daniel Long. Sitting next to me is my lovely wife, Robin. Hi, everyone. Today, we are in black and white, as you can see, because we are going to take a trip back in time. We are going to go to Aziza Street. <laughs> I got the whole black and white thing going on. I have no on idea the, what he's doing. Uh, there we go. Now we're in color. Anyway, we're going to take a trip back in time to Azusa Street, and we're going to be looking at the Azusa Street by Revival. And we're going to be comparing what people in the charismatic movement, Pentecostal movement say about what took place at that revival to what the newspaper articles actually said was going on during the revival. And I think you're going to find out that what you see in today's many of today's hyper charismatic churches with all the hooting, hollering, shouting, rolling around on the floor craziness that goes on in those churches is very similar to what was taking place at Azusa Street. Um, but some of the wild claims. Well, what are some of the wild claims that... I think we've got some good videos. We, we're not even going to tell you about them, about the wild claims that happened there. But yeah, you'll see. Some crazy stuff before reportedly we get, happened there. But before we get started, we need to do just a little bit of um, biography on some of the key players sure. of the Azusa Street revival. So One, we'll talk about William Seymour. Mm -hmm who was the pastor at Azusa Street, give you a little bit of background about him. So he was born in 1870 in Louisiana. His parents were emancipated slaves. And please keep in mind during this video that during this time frame, there was segregation, mm -hmm. there were the Jim Crow laws, mm -hmm. there was a lot of blatant racism. Mm -hmm. We're gonna try to blur out a lot of that. Yeah. And, and just as we look at some of these articles, as Robin was saying, that that's why she's saying this, because some of the race, racial slurs, slurs and the things that are said in these articles are really offensive. And that's one of the reasons why I kind of hesitated doing uh, a video on Azusa Street. But, um, but anyway, that's the way our country was during this time. Sure. So... Um Born in 1870, when he was about 25, he moved to Indianapolis. Um, he attempt, attended a Methodist Episcopal church there. He seemed to move around a lot. Um, and he was introduced to the holiness movement through a group which believed in faith healing, foot washing, the imminent second coming of Christ, and a distinct separation from the world. So in 1901, so he's about 30 years old now. He moved to Cincinnati. He probably attended a Bible school. He was a waiter. He got smallpox and he lost vision in his left eye, I think. So you will hear him referred to as the one-eyed black man in a lot of the videos that we've seen and the articles that we're reading. Um, a couple of years later, he went to Houston, and this was a really important one. This is where he met the African-American holiness leader. She was a pastor, Lucy Farrow. Lucy Farrow was tied to Charles Parham. Um, soon after they met, Lucy Farrow went to become Charles Parham's nanny, and she asked William Seymour to take over her church, to pastor her church. So he did that, and it was soon after that that she invited him to Charles Parham's Bible School in Texas. Mm -hmm. He went there because of the Jim Crow laws. He could not even sit in a classroom with 
white people. So he sat outside the classroom and he listened to Charles Parham's teachings for about a month. He was then invited to go to Los Angeles for a revival, to start a, a revival. So he went to Los Angeles, I think it was in February of 1906. And he preached one night. And when he went back to preach the next day, the doors were locked because he had preached about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues. And they did not like that at all. Mm -hmm. Um I think he disagreed with Parham's teaching. Parham had taught that speaking in tongues was speaking in a foreign language for evangelistic purposes, yep. uh, just like the book of Acts. Mm -hmm. Whereas William Seymour believed more that it was a heavenly language that came, you were to be baptized with the Holy Spirit, you would start speaking in tongues. Right. And, and Parham did believe that too. Parham did believe that uh, the baptism of the Holy, that the speaking in tongues was evidence of the baptism of the Holy mm -hmm. Spirit. But he just, he just believed what the Bible said in Acts, that they were actual languages. And I think Seymour disagreed with him on that. Yes, point. he did. Um, so he was locked out. Some of the people in that church liked what they heard. So he was invited to stay with a friend. I think that man's name was Edward Lee. Um, and he started having Bible studies and preaching from Edward Lee's home. And then he went to a place on Bonnie Bray Street, really popular name you'll hear if you ever study Azusa Street. Mm -hmm. And this couple, he would have meetings every night. So it was about in April, probably the first or second week in April of 1906, that one of the men received the gift of tongues and started speaking in tongues. Very exciting. Went to the meeting and he and Seymour told everyone that this man had received the gift of tongues. And then soon after that, everyone started speaking in tongues. William Seymour had not yet spoken in tongues and was praying that he would receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So it was about three days later that Seymour received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. In the meantime, crowds of people were coming to Bonnie Bray, Sp Bray Street, mm -hmm. and there was a lot of commotion, very exciting, especially after the tongues event on, I think, April 9th. Um, so they knew they had to find a new place because they were meeting at someone's home. And they found the building on 312 Azusa Street, which had previously been an African Episcopal Church, um, a long time prior to that, and then had turned into a warehouse. Mm -hmm. um, it was a smelly old mess that they had to do a little fixing up for. So mm -hmm. that's how they got to Azusa Street. Yeah. And so that's the kind of the background. Now mm -hmm. let's look at what took place there because the, the, the miracles – that supposedly had taken place there are just outrageous. I mean, you hear all kinds of stuff. Uh, and so we're going to start with, um, you know, body limbs growing. So here's the first clip of um, a man's arm growing at Azusa Street. And he looked at y'all and said, y'all want to have some fun like we did about a year ago when the man's leg grew out? He said, well, we're going to. And he laid his hands on his shoulder. Brother Garcia looked down and said, Brother Tommy, I can look down into that hole in his shoulder and see the bone. He said he started praying for it and said all of a sudden the bone started growing out in about four inches. The flesh started growing around it. And he said I sat there. It took only seconds but to him it was slow motion. And he watched it as it just grew out. And he says then he watched his the fingernails appeared all of a sudden. Alright, so that's that's one body part growing. Here's the second uh, body part growing, the, uh, uh, somebody's chin coming back into place. This man, his chin dropped down to about here. How he ate, I don't know. And, and even those people at Azusa told me they didn't know. But they started praying for him, and then you could hear bones popping, and, and his chin started coming back up. And with just in a few minutes, he was normal. And, and, and Lucille said it was really kind of effective. Lovely so. <laughs> visual effects. Thank you very Great much. Great visual effects. Um, anyway, so 
you know, these are just some of the claims that uh, people in the charismatic movement say took place. They also talked about the blind being able to see, people being healed from being deaf, deaf and uh, mm -hmm. other things like that. And on top of that, there was the tongues that were um, that people were claiming to speak. There were people claiming to have. Uh, not even been able to play the piano or a musical yes. instrument and all of a sudden they're possessed by the Holy Spirit and he plays the piano or plays the violin for them right. and it sounds like heavenly music. Yeah, Just claims a lot of, of them even going up to the piano and the piano playing and them not even playing the piano. I think that the picture that a lot of the newspapers that we'll get into later that they paint is that th it was a chaotic situation for a few years, especially the first few months, but it went on for three years, day and night, there were meetings. And in the middle of the night, they would hear howling and screaming and all kinds of antics going on. And I think on numerous occasions, the police were called. Yeah, they were. And there was violence that were there were actually fights that took place. And even mm -hmm. Seymour later on uh, really had to call in Charles Parham because it really became a mess and he didn't know what to do. And Charles right. Parham comes he goes in and he evaluates the situation and what does he do he says this stuff is of the devil <laughs> he right. says this stuff is not of god and i'm not a parham fan at all you can look back at my videos but uh parham was right the stuff was just crazy it, it was craziness going on there and and that actually coincides with what the newspapers actually say so yeah. you know the azusa street revival was supposed to be what launched the um Pentecostal movement. And it did because it did. we had missionaries leaving the Azusa Street mission and going out and taking that stuff back to their own countries, similar to what we saw in the Toronto Blessing right. years ago in the Toronto Blessing, where the, the pastors were coming to Toronto and they were taking back that mm -hmm. wicked thing to their churches and spreading that all over the and place. And not only taking it back to other countries, but as it's and it's called like the the beginning of the Pentecostal mm -hmm. movement because people would go there. A lot of pastors went there and then they took that idea mm -hmm. of having that revival go on and they took it back to their cities. And you can find, I think Danny found a number of articles in different cities around that time frame, mm -hmm. Pasadena, Salem, Oregon, yeah. up in Cincinnati. So it just spread across the United States and there from were here. And there were a lot of crazy and the, these pastors were taking back some crazy ideas with them. Things like automatic writing, uh, just all kinds of weird stuff that came out of that whole revival. And as we said, we're going to show you some um, some newspaper articles. So this next video clip that we're going to be looking at is from a guy named Tommy Welchel. And Tommy uh, went and m moved to California as a young man. And he was about 17, 18, mm -hmm. ran into a woman and got his life straightened up. And she introduced him to a number of people who had been at mm -hmm. Azusa Street. Yeah. So he tells the Azusa Street stories, um, what he claims other people have told him that happened. Yeah. And one of those stories is the crazy story about the Shekinah glory. So check this out. But there, there at Azusa is where this... Shekinah glory started floating in. Miracles galore were going on. But now, every now and then, Seymour would get that box off his head and get up and start walking around and finally he'd say, Charles, play this tune. And usually it was the, the tune was, the comforter has come. He'd start playing it. He says this, Shekinah glory then would start rising. Well, the first, Seymour would say, now everybody, you start singing in the spirit. And some of you don't know that's singing in tongues. When they started singing in tongues, the Shekinah glory would start rising. It'd fill the whole building and it'd spill over on the outside. And pretty soon, a flame would shoot up out of the roof. Go about 50 foot high. Then about 50 foot from that, a ball of fire would appear. And flames would come down out of that ball of fire and go through the fire coming up. Science said when he was playing, he'd stop and just watch his hands. 
No, we didn't take his hands away, but he wasn't playing it. He was watching. Something else was moving. And he said that was just, and it sounded like a thousand pianos playing. Brother Christopher would be playing the violin, and he says, the time I was sitting all of a sudden I stop and I'm looking. I'm not moving my arms. He says, and it sounded like a thousand violins. And the people would swear they were hearing the same thing. And that's when the big miracles would start happening. And, uh, but now, as far as the power of God falling, it got so far away at Azusa Street that down on Union Station, they had this big wooden platform. People were coming from all over the world. Well, they're landing in boats. They weren't landing in planes back then, folks, in 1906. They came in on trains or buses from the docks. They were getting off on the platform, and David Garcia walked right by it every, every time he went to, he came by one afternoon, and there was bodies scattered all over the platform. He thought a disaster had happened. He went up, he's looking at him, he looked at some of the workers over there, and he says, we don't know what's happening. They get off and then they fall down on the ground and start jabbering something. But they were speaking in tongues. Well, he ran to Azusa Street and he could get and got a hold of Frank Barlaman and got him to come down. Practically dragging him down there. And then finally, then he says, they just got the Holy Ghost. He says, yeah, Frank, but what do we do? He says, let's get him up. He pulled him towards Azusa. So if things like that happened, that stuff would have been all over the newspapers and I can tell you right now that I have found way more stuff about Charles Fox Parham and his crazy annex than I have about William Seymour or the Azusa Street Revival. I had to really do some digging just to find some of the articles that I found on the Azusa Street Revival. And, and they're there, but um, there's not as many as some of these other um, popular, charismatic, and early Pentecostal people. Right. Anyway, he mentioned in that video a box. Right in the beginning of the video, I think he mentioned about he took off the box. He took the box off his head. And mm -hmm. a lot of accounts state that William Seymour, during a great part of the meetings, would have a box over his head. He like, would be sitting down and literally like a crate kind mm -hmm. of box just on top of his head. Um, and it, it attracted a lot of negative attention at times. But he said that when his head was in the box, God was able to talk to him and God would tell him when to take the box off and try to have some kind of order in the meetings. It didn't really make any sense other than just being another interesting happening at Azusa Street. Yeah. And you and I were talking uh, when we were putting this, all, all of this research together. And I, you know, I had never heard about the. Some of you may have heard about him having a box over his head mm -hmm. in his meetings there on Azusa Street, but I had never heard that. And I mentioned to you that I, I would think that the newspaper articles would have mentioned something about that. But one of the things I think about is, would the apostles, can, can you see that? happening anywhere I can't see any scripture. pastor doing anything like that so uh, it's just strange it's very folks. strange very very strange mm -hmm. so let's talk about the shekinah glory <laughs> uh, folks that is so outlandish outrageous yes. out out there. in left field <laughs> i did not know that shekinah glory was not a biblical term like it's, it's not, not mentioned in the bible mm -hmm. until i started studying it for this yeah one of the things that you see throughout scripture robin is you see whenever the presence of god uh is in the room something happens to the person that is uh in the presence in God's of presence. God, they fall yeah. on their face. They they don't shake around violently, but they they're they're. I think of Isaiah in Isaiah chapter six, how mm -hmm. he cried out, "Woe is me!" That that's a ju that was a judgment he was placing on himself. Woe is me! I am undone. Yes. Even Peter, when he was in the boat with Jesus. And Jesus uh, told him to cast his net on the other side, and he caught a great number yeah. of fish. 
Peter fell and said, go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. Um, but I was talking to you about the, um, the, the glory that filled the temple when Solomon's prayer had ended mm -hmm. and how the priests couldn't even go into the temple to perform their duties because the glory was so great. And it seems to me like whenever you hear people, well, like Tommy Wetchell describe the glory in Azusa Street, you hear the Bethel people talk about the glory cloud. It's just willy nilly, you know? Exactly. He does go on to say that the children would play in the Shekinah glory because it was kind of like a mist or a fog that would rise up from the ground so you would catch the kids playing in the shekinah glory and i'm sorry i don't know if you mentioned this if there is a fireball 50 feet over the 50 feet of the fire plume i would think that would get a huge amount of attention a huge amount of attention they would be all in the newspapers and as i said i found more on the other early pentecostal leaders than i did on azusa street right. to be honest with you um there they you know that's just my own research maybe other people have found more than i have i'm not a professional by mm. any stretch of the imagination when it comes to doing research in newspapers.com but i have um I've I've been do, using it a long time, and I've only found um, you know seven, eight, nine articles that uh, even are, are right around that time frame that Azusa took place. Now I found a bunch of uh, articles in 1908, 1909, and on upward of the effects that took place after Azusa Street, the right. missionaries that were sent out, and the different churches that came out of Azusa Street, but nothing, not a whole lot about the actual church itself good we do have an article you found in april of 1906 so it would mm -hmm. have been just a couple of weeks after azusa street started yeah. do you want yeah. to go to that please do that okay so this article in the los angeles daily times um wednesday april 18th 1906 is called weird babble of tongues and it says breathing strange utterances and mourning a creed which it would seem no sane mortal could understand. The newest religious sect has started in Los Angeles. Meetings are held in a tumble down shack on Azusa Street near San Pedro Street. And the devotees of the weird doctrine practice the most fanatical rites, preach the wildest theories and work themselves into a state of mad excitement in their peculiar zeal. Um, it goes on to say colored people in a sprinkling of whites compose the congregation. The night is made hideous in the neighborhood by the howlings of the worshipers who spend hours swaying forth and back in a nerve wracking attitude of prayer and supplication. They claim to have the gift of tongues and to be able to comprehend the babble. Such a startling claim has never yet been made by any company of fanatics, even in Los Angeles, the home of almost numberless creeds sacred tenets reverently mentioned by the orthodox believer are dealt with in a familiar if not irreverent manner by these latest religionists an old colored exhorter blind in one eye is the major domo of the company with his stony optic fixed on some luckless unbeliever the old man yells his defiance and challenges an answer anathemas are heaped upon him who shall dare to gainsay the utterances of the preacher clasped in his big fist the brother holds a miniature bible from which he reads at intervals one or two words never more after an hour spent in exhortation the brethren present are invited to join in a meeting of prayer, song, and testimony then it is that pandemonium breaks loose and the bounds of reason are passed by those who are filled with the spirit whatever that may be so shouts i'm not even going to try to read that <laughs> shouts an old woman in a frenzy of religious zeal swinging her arms wildly about her she continues with the strangest harangue ever uttered few of her words are intelligible and for the most part her testimony contains the most outrageous jumble of syllables which are listened to with awe by the company one of the wildest of the meetings was held last night, 
and the highest pitch of excitement was reached by the gathering, which continued in worship until nearly midnight. The old exhorter urged the sisters to let the tongues come forth, and the women gave themselves over to a riot of religious fervor. As a result, a dame was overcome with excitement and almost fainted, undismayed by the fearful attitude of the The worshiper, another woman jumped to the floor and began a wild gesticulation, which ended in a gurgle of wordless prayers, which were nothing less than shocking. She's speaking in unknown tongues, announced the leader in an awed whisper. Keep on, sister. The sister continued until it was necessary to assist her to a seat because of her bodily fatigue. So you can see from what you read there in that article that... These things weren't uncommon in the Aziza Street Revival. There are other articles that are very similar of people uh, just the, of just frenzy, just just outright frenzy. And we don't have time to go over right. every article. We've got one more we want to look at in just a few minutes. But it's it, it was chaos. It was absolute chaos. I think it's important to mention, too, that it was offensive to the reporters and so many people, the blacks and whites were mm-hmm. worshiping together. And that's why you see so many references to the color of the people mm-hmm. in that room, that blacks and whites were together. And it was not natural to the people at that time. And many of them did not like it. And you can almost sense that and how this was reported. Yeah. And um It's unfortunate because, you know, the Bible makes it very clear there's neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, neither male nor female in the gospel. That uh, so it's a very sad time. It was a very racist time, but that's that that is true. That that is what was going on. Um, But you can also sense the almost the 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 confusion of the reporter as he's looking at this going what the, it's almost like what in the world is going on this is not a religious service and it reminds me of what took place in the mariah woodworth edder meetings some of the same types of thing and the way the reporters were reporting her meetings kind of the same way like what in the world is going on here you got people rolling on the floor you've got people uh in trances so these are the types of things that were taking place so it makes you wonder almost why were so many people going to this me- these meetings? Was it to receive um, religious teachings or the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Or was it to see the show mm-hmm. that was reported that was going on In there? In the newspapers, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And what the reporter described as tongues when he wrote out what this woman was saying <laughs> Mm-hmm. Um, really isn't tongues at all. That's not what uh, you would find in Scripture. And we've done a whole video on that called Biblical Tongues or Gibberish. And you can see that. We'll put the link to that in the YouTube description. And you can see that. But um, the point is, is that Biblical tongues were languages. And they weren't just these weird uh, babblings that you see in charismatic churches and that you saw there in the newspaper reporter's description in the Los Angeles Times. It just wasn't like that. And we also know that there were complaints, weren't there? A lot of complaints about the noise, like the I think the reporter used the word howlings, mm-hmm. just about the noise level, the time that um, the meetings lasted till the middle of the night. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah it was Pol- a, a disorderly series of events. They literally had a police officer stationed there at Azusa Street because, yeah, mm-hmm. because of all of the violence and, and some of the craziness that was going on yeah. in those meetings. The Bible makes it very clear that worship is to be orderly and that if there's tongues present, there's to be an interpreter. And the mm-hmm. Corinthian church was a mess, wasn't it? Very much so. There was all kinds of crazy things going on in the Corinthian church. There was uh, there was sexual immorality. There were divisions. There were um, people getting drunk at the Lord's Supper. There were people taking each other to court. And Paul talks about how these Corinthians were not even orderly in their worship. And so he rebukes them. All right, so why don't we look at some biblical passages that talk about orderly worship, since we know that that is what the Bible uh, says should be going on in a in a we're in a church service. Okay, so I'm in First Corinthians chapter fourteen. I'm going to read verses twenty six through forty. 
What then, brothers, when you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. If anyone speak in a tongue, let there be only two or at most three, and each in turn, and let someone interpret. But if there is no one to interpret, let each of them keep silent in church and speak to himself and to God. So one of the things that I want to point out is how Paul says there, but if there is no one to interpret, let each of them keep silent in the church and speak to himself and to God. That is a command from Scripture. That is a holy apostle that is tell, giving instructions about what was to take place when there was any gift of tongues going on in a church. It wasn't to be this mass confusion, and it wasn't to be um, you know, a bunch of people jabbering in tongues at once, and there was to be an interpreter present. Even in the verse prior, there should only be two or three at mm. most. It is not a chorus of tongue speakers. It's not a free for all, folks. Anyway, continue. Mm. Verse 29. Let two or three prophets speak and let the others weigh what is said. If a revelation is made to another sitting there, let the first be silent. For you can all prophesy one by one so that all may learn and all be encouraged. And the spirits of prophets are subject to prophets. For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. As in all the churches of the saints... The women should keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission, as the law also says. If there's anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home, for it's shameful for a woman to speak in church. Or was it from you that the word of God came? Or are you the only ones it has reached? If anyone thinks that he is a prophet or spiritual, he should acknowledge that the things I am writing to you are a command of the Lord. If anyone does not recognize this, he is not recognized. So, my brothers, earnestly desire to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues. But all things should be done decently and in order. Robin, Paul was rebuking the Corinthians for the way they were acting during their worship for their service. disorderly worship. This should be a lesson to anyone within the charismatic movement. If you would just look at this whole thing in context and ask yourself, what was Paul doing here? Was he praising the Corinthians for their worship or was he rebuking them? Was he trying to correct them? And that's what he was doing, folks. This is not an example mm. that should have be taking place even in the churches uh, today. And it certainly shouldn't have been happening the way it was happening in Azusa Street. Right. So there is something that you and I were talking about last night. We were sitting at our kitchen table. We were going over the video and you had mentioned uh, Second Peter and a very good point mm -hmm. because one of the things that we don't see in the hyper charismatic churches today, what we didn't see in Parham's meetings and what we don't see or didn't see in the Azusa Street Revival is self-control. You had crazy stuff going on mm. during these meetings, and there That's was true. not self-control. And folks, that is one of the fruit of fruits of the Holy Spirit is, well, the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. So right. you were talking about a passage in Second Peter, and I really so like can, that. Okay, so we'll go ahead and read that. It's Second Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 10. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with steadfastness and steadfastness with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love for if these qualities are yours and are increasing they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our lord jesus christ for whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election, for if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So I just think that 
they didn't mention speaking in tongues as one of the steps that we take to attain godliness. Absolutely. And that's what you hear. Um, you hear that tongues is a way to achieve this uh, godly lifestyle. You just got to pray in the spirit and they equate praying in the spirit with speaking in tongues. Right. You're right. We've got another article. One of the things that we, we, we just want to highlight about the Azusa Street Revival is the chaos and the frenzy. The neighbors complained over and over again to the authorities. They couldn't even sleep at night. Folks, you don't see this kind of stuff going on in the uh, book mm -hmm. of Acts. You know, they, they talk about the early church in the book of Acts and they want to imitate that church. Well, folks, the church in the book of Acts didn't do these things. They didn't keep the neighbors up at night. They were a peaceful and loving uh, early group of Christians. They weren't like what you see and hear today, and they weren't like what you heard at the Azusa Street Revival. You got an True. article that you want to read um, from newspapers.com. And by the way, folks, all of these articles are from newspapers.com. I just want to give a quick... Uh, just let you know, we downloaded um, these as JPEGs, not because we don't want to show you on newspapers.com, but because we wanted to be able to blot out some of the any racial slurs, any racial slurs or, or, or things like that, language. inappropriate things that uh, shouldn't, you know, just shouldn't be repeated. Sure. So this one is from the Los Angeles Herald on July 22nd, 1906, so a number of months after the beginning of Azusa Street, and it's entitled, Holy Jumpers Are Again Noisy, A Sect on Azusa Street Renews Devotions. So it says, after a week's rest, the Holy Jumpers, who have become notorious on Azusa Street, renewed their services last night and succeeded in making more noise and causing more complaint than on any previous night of worship. Patrolman Birchild and Moiner, for two hours, tried to quell the motley crew um, who engaged in the strenuous services. The one-eyed leader of the Jumpers decided last Monday to rest the services for one week. The nights were long for the preacher, however, and several times during the week, he and a few of the chosen members congregated in the church, formerly a livery, livery stable, and held service, while the police department has listened to innumerable complaints regarding the noises of insane people on Azusa Street. After the week of rest and faithful, excuse me, after the week of rest, the faithful assembled last night and the services will be long remembered by those who attended and by those who live within five blocks of mm -hmm. the church livery stable as the most emphatically enthusiastic that has ever been held there. One elderly woman was carried to the front doors in a faint, and two boys, less than 15 years of age, became so noisy that they were told to leave the room by officers. A complaint has been made to the health department that the ventilation of the building is in violation of sanitary laws. Residents in the section have said that the meetings have become such that it is impossible to sleep near the meeting place, and it is said that a petition in remonstrance may be circulated. Yeah, so you can see right there just how people thought, what people thought of the, the meetings there. They were loud, they were noisy, the people were obnoxious, the police were there. Every single night the police were there. They There were officers that were stationed mm -hmm. there. That was where they were. Um, and then they mentioned the ventilation in the building. And I have an article uh, that I've got saved that talks about flies being around a woman and them that, that's in a trance. And people having to, you know, swap, uh, the, flies swap the flies away. And not only that, but talks about the smell of the place. And so it just... It, 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 it wasn't what you hear right in by by modern charismatic you know preachers and teachers that talk about Azusa's this great thing that took place the interesting point that i found in this was that william seymour decided to stop services for a week mm. uh, a number of articles that i read point to the fact that he started to second guess what was going on in the services and didn't quite know how to stop it. You mentioned that he called Parham mm -hmm. and asked Parham to come to help him get everything in order or to kind of look at things and see if it was going appropriately. When Parham came to the services, he 
said it was horrible, that it was totally out of control. However, Parham was known to be a little bit of a racist. Yes, he was. So he did not like the fact that blacks and whites were worshiping together. Um, He did not like the babble of tongues that he heard. He actually went two blocks, two or three blocks down the street and started a revival of his own and tried to get all of Seymour's people to come to his meetings. Which didn't work. That did not happen. So, But it did did cause a, quite a rift between Seymour and Parm at that time as Parm wanted to take over and Seymour was like, no, this is my church. From that point, though, both men kind of suffered in their reputation mm-hmm. and Seymour eventually did just kind of the services started getting slower and slower, a little bit less and less, less popular. And he was known to just question whether he truly believed in speaking in tongues by the end of his career. Yeah. Yeah. So, folks, I think you can see uh, just from what we presented in this video Mm -hmm. that, um, you know, the Azusa Street revival did happen. Yeah. And there was a lot of stuff that was taking place and the newspapers did report it. But the newspapers tell a different story than what we hear from many of the reports from the Charismatics and Pentecostals that talk about Azusa Street. Um, So the Azusa Street revival really was a revival of frenzy, wouldn't you say? I would think so. Yeah. Yeah. So, folks, thank you so much for joining us. And it is our plan to do more videos on uh, the early Pentecostal movement and talk about other leaders. Um, And we've got some in mind. And so hopefully uh, we'll be doing more videos like this. So see you next week. Bye.